It is a wonderful honor to welcome Jeff Berkner for joining the program. He served as the United States Assistant Secretary of State for Legislative Affairs under Condoleezza Rice, a remarkable woman. Uh, he recently authored a new book titled American Materialism, Why Our Domestic Policies, Our Foreign Policies, and Our Intelligence Assessments Often Fail. Jeff, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. Thank you very much. I should like to begin by uh, thanking Professor Mark Blitz of Claremont McKenna University for introducing me to you. So, uh, tell me about, uh, you know, how long have you guys uh, go back? Uh, we go way back. Uh, we taught together at the University of Pennsylvania in the 1970s. Uh, and uh, he was a close friend then and remains a close friend now. In fact, I just had lunch with him about a month ago. Oh, wonderful. Uh, so we've uh, we've intersected several times. He worked on the Foreign Relations Committee staff for me for a while. Uh, then he was at the Hudson Institute and uh, uh, where I was on the board. And uh, and uh, I, I see him um, every time he's in Washington. <laughs> okay. So uh, I suppose uh, please uh, let me know that I said hi next time you guys speak. I will, I will do it. I will do it. I, uh, we're also close friends with the third person in this little group, Bill Crystal. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had dinner with, uh, with Bill and his wife on Saturday, actually, and uh, talked a little bit about Mark as well. Wonderful. Yeah, I've, um, I've been a fan of uh, Bill's uh, show, Conversations, for a while. I, I've been trying to get him on this podcast, but uh, alas, his uh, schedule does not allow it. Uh, okay. Well... He, uh, I, I did one of his conversations once, and it's, it's a very good occasion to uh, spend a lot of time in depth on one subject. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so the, that's always a worthy thing to do if you can work it out. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I, I did find that uh, episode uh, where uh, you and uh, Bill, Mr. Crystal, talks. Um, I believe uh, the book that you guys were discussing was uh, one of your previous books, The Vanishing Congress. So, yes. Uh, I wonder, ever since uh, the publication of that book, uh, how has Congress changed or haven't changed? Well, unfortunately, it hasn't changed much. Uh, if anything, it's vanished even further. Uh, I made the point that I'm a very great fan of the uh, founding fathers in this country uh, and a great fan of the Declaration, the Constitution, the Federalist Papers, and so forth. But I think they made one uh, bad guess. And that was uh, the guess that the Congress would be the most powerful institution uh, of the three uh, branches of government. And uh, I don't think it's all, uh, not good. Okay, that's it. Yeah. Um, so uh, what did the founders intend when um, uh, they instituted Congress? Well, I think they thought this would be the branch that was closest to the people and uh, the branch that would uh, make the laws would really shape the basic framework of everything that went on. Um, and there's no doubt that if the Congress could ever get itself organized, uh, it's a very powerful institution. You could see an occasional example of that. For example, when the Congress, both parties, decided that the head of the Secret Service had not been doing her job, it only took a few days before she resigned. So Congress can be a very powerful institution, but uh, for the most part, it uh, has ended up fighting amongst itself, setting up procedures that complicate its own work and, um, and has in a way ceded authority, not only to the executive branch, but also to the Supreme Court. And so um, I, I think it just hasn't quite turned out the way the framers thought it would. It still could in principle, but it doesn't really in practice. Now, in your time serving in the American government, uh, what are some of the most valuable lessons that you've learned? Well, I, I, I could mention a number of them. I uh, uh, First of all, I've seen uh, things from both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue, as we say, from the Congress and the executive branch downtown. And um, I, I, I found that um, you, you really uh, need to have good relationships. Uh, Donald Trump seems to have gotten away with that fairly, fairly simple don't. And so I, I try never to make enemies needlessly uh, 
to be as firm as I needed to be when the time came, but uh, not to annoy people uh, without good reason. Uh, and, and so that's one. Uh, another thing which I learned, um, and um, this is really the subject of the my most recent book, uh, American Materialism, which you were just kind enough to mention. Um, I, I think that there's an excessive reliance on the idea of material causation here in the United States, which um, affects and diminishes our policies. Uh, this uh, first came to me, if I can tell you a brief story, uh, way back in 1978, um, when this first came to me as an idea, uh, my senator that I worked for, Senator Luger from Indiana, went on the last congressional delegation trip to uh, to, to Iran to, to meet with the Shah, who was then our very close ally. And so I followed events in Iran very closely. And uh, our intelligence agencies predicted at the time that uh, the Shah would be in good shape to continue for a long, long time, well into the 1980s and so forth. And what happened was he abdicated very shortly afterward in January of 1979. And so one day I ran into a, an acquaintance of mine after that had occurred, a mid-level uh, employee at the CIA. And I said to him, how did, how did you guys get this so wrong? How did, you, how did you miss this? After all, Iran wasn't just some country, but it was uh, after Israel, probably our closest ally in the region along with Saudi Arabia, one of the two twin pillars protecting the oil coming out of the Gulf to the Western world. And uh, his answer was very interesting. He said, well, you know, we in the intelligence business are very good at counting things. Uh, we could count how many troops does the Shah have? How many, how many hundreds of thousands of troops? How many tanks? How many thousands of tanks? How many thousand secret service, SOVAC agents does he have? And we saw nothing on the horizon that uh, possibly could uh, undo him. And um, he said, we really didn't take seriously non-material factors, uh, things like religion and, and uh, other items, which we call today, I suppose, under the heading of uh, cultural issues. And he said, and therefore we missed this. And as I thought about it all the way through my career, both in the Senate and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, downtown at the State Department, it seemed to me I could see this same thing happening over and over again. It's not that economics isn't important, but it's not the only thing that's important. And so that's a lesson I, I came away with, uh, which I try to describe in some considerable, uh, some people have said very much too considerable detail, in, in my book on American materialism. So I think those two things for openers are, are two things which I'd mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yes, and of course it has been 45 years um, since um, 1979, the year of the yeah. uh, mm -hmm. Iranian yes. revolution. There's yes. some political shakeup uh, with the death of one president and the anointing of a new president, but so far I think Iran is back to square one, even though there, were, it, there yes, had been... It, it, yeah. Yes, it, it continues as a theocracy, and uh, the government very much opposed to the United States and and to our interests. Um, and uh, nothing much in that regard has changed. I think there's always been a kind of a uh, misplaced hunt for the moderates in the Iranian government. Uh, there there aren't really any, and uh, not to say there aren't moderates or people friendly to the United States among the Iranian population. Uh, the Iranian population, I think, harbors no particular ill will toward the United States, but uh, the government certainly does, has, does, and I think for the foreseeable future will continue to do so. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so I mentioned that you serve under one uh, Condoleezza Rice. So yes. what are some of the qualities that you find um, that uh, in her that can be emulated in future leaders, particularly people of her position, say? Yeah. Well, she was very, very smart. Uh, I think that's pretty clear. Uh, we used to uh, uh, brief her all the time on uh, things before she went up to Congress. Uh, I'd ride up to the Congress with her, and she'd listen to me droning on about what the senator was going to ask and what that senator was going to ask. And, 
And um, it was kind of an unhappy trip up, but she was always very happy when she was done with the congressional oversight hearings. Uh, she's very, very smart, um, very extensive knowledge of the, of the world. And um, also I think uh, equally important, was not someone who was going to rush in and take a position on an issue um, on a kind of an emotional basis, but rather to stop and think it through. Um, you can see an example of, of what I'm talking about with this whole question of whether or not Nippon Steel can buy uh, the U.S. steel operation in Pittsburgh. Uh, Trump is against it. Biden's against it. Harris is against it. They're all flat wrong. It's all done on an emotional, uh, we've got to do things here in America basis. There's a story in the Wall Street Journal today, and most of the workers now apparently in Pittsburgh think that the sale would be a very good idea because they know their jobs depend on it. And so she was never one to um, just sort of leap into an issue on an emotional basis, but was one to think it through and uh, consider the options and the consequences downfield a little bit. And, and I think that made her um, very effective, very effective. She also uh, was kind to people to the extent that she could be. When she needed to disagree with somebody, she did. And I, I saw that a number of times. But uh, she didn't do that for uh, no good reason. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I believe she currently heads the Hoover Institution at Stanford. Yes. So I'm, yes. I'm sure yes. you get to meet her whenever you uh, are around that area. Well, I, I missed a chance to meet her. Uh, she went out to uh, Indianapolis to speak at the dedication of a statue for Senator Luger uh, just on uh, September 3rd. And I very much wanted to be there, but uh, I had some health issues that prevented me from traveling. But uh, it would have been a wonderful time for me because she was there and it was all about Senator Luger, who I'd worked for for seven or eight years, and so I, I, I missed it. But I have seen her occasionally, but she had a very busy schedule, and and, uh, and, and it's, it's not uh, easy to catch up with her unless you're in the particular loop she's in at the moment. I see. Yeah. So um, we are recording this on the 17th of uh, September, so a few years, a uh, few days, sorry, removed from the anniversary of uh, September the 11th. So, yes. Uh, uh, I wonder, uh, where were you on that day? Uh, I was downtown on 16th and L Streets, uh, just a couple blocks up from the White House. And uh, and uh, somebody said, turn on the TV at 9 o'clock in the morning. I turned it on, and you could see the plane hit the first building. And then when it hit the second building, um, it was clear that this was not an accident, but it was deliberate. Um, and so... Um, uh, I, I, at that point, uh, sent all of my employees from our office home, and uh, I stayed to answer questions and so forth. And uh, pretty soon, you could see the smoke rising uh, outside my window that uh, came from the Pentagon. Uh, there were all kinds of rumors that the State Department had been hit or the White House had been hit and so forth. But uh, this was all from the Pentagon, and uh, I uh, fielded calls for four or five hours of uh, parents of people who work for me or relatives, spouses, um, uh, saying that they were fine and that they were heading home and there was no danger particularly. So uh, it was a very real experience uh, when you were downtown feeling it firsthand. Um, and uh, I, I realized when I finally went home that the world was never quite going to be the same again. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that the, the same failures that led to um, American intelligence agencies not seeing Khomeini coming um, is, are the same as the ones that led you to fail to see um, the September 11 attacks coming? Well, that, that, that's a very good question. I, I, I think not in a direct way. I mean, in a direct way, it was a failure to uh, integrate information between departments and agencies. Uh, that if you look afterward at things, you would see that they had all the information they needed to be highly suspicious of what's coming. Uh, on, on the other hand, I think there was a general sense that uh, um, how could the United States, as far away from Afghanistan, as rich as it was, as, as powerful as it was, was going to uh, experience any particular problem. 
uh, from a couple of people, a handful of people really, uh, who uh, had ideas in their head, not any economic interest in in, in uh, uh, going down with their planes for sure. But uh, again, uh, on the basis of ideas, which maybe we didn't take quite seriously enough. Yes, and have we managed to learn uh, to take um, these ideas more seriously since? No, no. Uh, I, I, my answer to that is simple. I, I, I document in the book a lot of ways in which we, uh, we we act in the same fashion with regard to our domestic programs, with with education, with crime policy, with agriculture, with all the aspects of domestic policy. I talk about our foreign policy and uh, uh, and the fact that. Uh, for the most part, uh, the everyday work of the State Department uh, occurs around two things. One, foreign assistance, giving money to other countries, and two, uh, economic sanctions, which is a very great overestimation of the importance of economics to be able to shape uh, people's behavior. Uh, it clearly can play some role, but it clearly is not even a very important role in shaping people's behavior. People who expect uh, policy changes to come from economic sanctions, take a look at Russia, for example. I mean, we, or better yet, North Korea. We've, we've sanctioned North Korea upside down, backward, forward, in every way you can. And their policy, so far as I can tell, hasn't changed one whit. Um, and so I don't see much uh, uh, example of, of, of uh, sanction policy, which has become really, when you think about it, the central tool of American foreign policy short of, short of war. Um, we have now, if you can believe this, roughly 11,000 different sanctions on countries, on groups, on individuals, on ships, on weapon systems, and, and what have you. And um, I, I, other than a few very special cases, um, I, I, I don't see much uh, positive consequence coming from these things. They're a way of expressing dissatisfaction, uh, but as a way to change regimes' policies, not so much, and as a way to change the regimes themselves, even less. Uh, see it again with Venezuela now. I mean, uh, we've, we've sanctions on Venezuela and expected some result. The, the Biden administration taken some sanctions off and expected some result. And, and, and it just is, is, a, is a minimal tool of foreign policy, not, not, a, not a crucial one, I think. I think the same thing is true of intelligence assessments. Um, I have a great deal of respect uh, for the intelligence agencies. Uh, our intelligence agencies uh, are, are divided in, in two parts, really, operations and analysis. And uh, on the operations side, uh, there's a lot of good work that gets done that's known by, by almost no one. And even on the analysis side, there's so many facts. If you've ever been the recipient of this intelligence of what the foreign minister said to the prime minister yesterday at breakfast or how many missiles China has lined up here or there, whatever, incredible information. But where the problem comes, I think, is in what's called the assessments. That is to say, what, what do we make of all this? What, what do we learn from this? And there it's a, a little different story, I think. And I don't think we've made very much progress uh, from 1978, 1979, all the way up till the present time. There are two very, very good examples of that uh, in recent days, one of which is Afghanistan and one of which is Ukraine. Um, in Afghanistan, um, there was a uh, intelligence assessment, all kinds of assessments that uh, the Afghan government could hold out for a while against the Taliban. Nobody thought it was going to be there forever, I don't think. But it would hold out. Pick your, pick your uh, uh, assessment, 18 months, two years, whatever. Um, and in a very perfect illustration of what I'm talking about, Joe Biden talked with the president, Ashraf Ghani, uh, just toward the end. And he said, look, uh, President Ghani, you have far more troops than the Taliban. You have far better weapons than the Taliban and far more weapons than the Taliban. You have everything you need to win. And what he was saying was you have all the material 
uh, conditions you need to win. And nevertheless, after the United States left, it, it didn't take but a week or two before the whole thing collapsed and, and uh, the Taliban took over. And so there, I think the intelligence community, again, um, did not do a very good service in, in uh, thinking through what the, the complications in, uh, of this outcome would be. Same thing true with uh, Ukraine. Um, our intelligence agency were excellent in terms of looking at the Russian threat and even in terms of, uh, of uh, estimating that the Russians were going to invade. Uh, they were much clearer to the truth than the Europeans and much clearer even than Zelensky, who I think harbored some hope right up till the end that the Russians wouldn't actually go ahead and invade. But And, and so that was all to the good. But what was their estimation? What was their prediction? Well, their prediction was that uh, the Russians uh, would be in Kyiv in, what, three, four, five days. Uh, some of the Russian intelligence guys were picking out apartments in Kyiv already to from which they would work to support whatever the new puppet government was. Um, but that didn't happen. Uh, why did they predict this? Well, because the Russians have more troops, they have more tanks, they have more weapons, uh, they have more material force. And it, it, it simply didn't take into account other factors. Um, now, over the long run, there's no doubt that economics does make a difference. And I think you see that now the Russians are gradually grinding down the Ukrainians uh, because they have more people, more troops, and so forth. But uh, in the short run, and the short run has been actually fairly long, it's been a few years now, uh, the intelligence assessments of what was going to happen were flat wrong. And so I understand that the intelligence community is undertaking a review of their thinking and, and uh, about including more factors in their analysis and trying to be a little bit more open to other factors. And I think that's a very good thing. Uh, I, I'm not privy to what's uh, the current thinking or how exactly they're proposing to do that. But I think the main thing that they should be thinking about is, are we relying too much on the notion of material causation um, or should we not give a little bit more credit to the importance of other things in people's lives? Human beings uh, find economics important, but they're not homo economicus. They're not economic men purely. They also have other interests, family, faith, country, uh, and, and so forth. And, and, and to simply um, uh, skip over those uh, it gives you a, a, a mistaken view of, of how the world works. And uh, I, I, again, I, I'm the last one that would say economics is not important. It's very important. I would even say in many cases, it's the most important thing, but it's certainly not the only thing. And you're going to take policies that are well-intentioned and, and, and cause them to fail because of that shortcoming, I think. So the short answer to your question again is no. Now, how should um, U.S. foreign policy understand this uh, emerging, I would call, alternative uh, global order with, I suppose, the BRICS countries and also uh, the rogue regimes like Iran and North Korea and Venezuela and yeah. Afghanistan? Well, I, I, I think, just in a word, it needs to take it much more seriously than we have been. Um, I think we're, uh, you can see when you talk to a lot of foreign policy makers, a kind of a thought that, well, you know, this is a temporary phenomenon and that uh, there are problems potentially between Russia and China and, uh, and Iran uh, has its own issues and so forth. But at the, the moment they've kind of aligned themselves, um, I, I think it's a much more serious problem. And so, again, uh, an assessment uh, based on, on not just this linear thinking about uh, things, but uh, that, that there may be something more transformative going on, I, I think is important. And, and, and I think we've not quite uh, wrapped our heads around that yet. Now, since we've uh, discussed um, the Iranian revolution and um, the 9-11 attacks, in what ways have um, the, I guess, foreign policy elites uh, 
fail to take um, the religion of Islam into question? Well, I, I, I think it, it's, <laughs> it's done better since Iran and since 9-11 particularly. Um, but there's still a sense, I think, that uh, religion is, um, eh, you know, it's like a social club, you know, it has its pluses and minuses. It's nothing that actually moves people, or moves their lives. Um, and so they don't really take it seriously. Um, part of it is because we don't here in this country. You go to a uh, an elite cocktail party in Georgetown, uh, does the subject of religion ever come up? Uh, answer, no. Um, and so there's a thought that, uh, well, since it didn't, doesn't seem to influence us so much, well, maybe it's not important anywhere. You see the same thing, I think, <clears throat> if I could take a minute to say, you see the same thing in the uh, assessments uh, that uh, many politicians make of, um, uh, of uh, middle class, lower middle class Americans on the economic scale. Um, they're called deplorables or know nothings and so forth. Um, and um, what this is, is, is really uh, an attempt to say, well, these people don't know what their true interests are. There was a guy who wrote a book in 2008 called What's the Matter with Kansas? And uh, his question was, how come poor people in Kansas would ever vote Republican? Don't they understand that it's the Democrats who want to give them more money, more things? Uh, and that sounds like a fair question, but when you think about it, it's got a kind of a huge bias built into it, namely that what's important? Economics. And that if somebody's not voting on straight economic interests, but rather voting on uh, cultural issues, as we call them today, voting on, on, on uh, social issues or voting on religious issues or whatever, uh, they're not voting on their true interests. And, uh, I, I think that's simply not true. And I think it has caused people to misconstrue very much um, why uh, people don't always vote on economic grounds. Uh, there has been a long time that, uh, that people uh, couldn't understand how Trump could get Republican votes uh, from people who are poor or, or, or at least not part of the elites or middle class, but uh, maybe a little bit further down the economic uh, scale. And um, the reason that was hard to understand was, again, the presupposition that, well, the true interests of people are always and everywhere economic, and they can't be anything else. And if they are, it's only because of ignorance uh, or willful blindness or, or, or falling for demagoguery and so forth. And the uh, and I think that's just a, a mistaken way to look at the world. Yes. And yeah, I'm reminded of um, at least two uh, titles of uh, political, political science and research that came out recently. Um, I believe one is titled White Rural Rage. Um, yeah. And the other, I think it's called The Kingdom, The Power and the Glory. And it, it researches the um, evangelical movement and uh, its ties towards uh, Donald Trump and... <clears throat> I think both works shows um, a certain blindness when it comes to understanding uh, the Trump voting bloc. Yes, entirely. Um, I think so too. But as I say, this uh, guy, Thomas Franks, in his book on Kansas, spelled this all out pretty clearly in 2008, which is what now, uh, 16 years ago. Uh, and so it's it's been there to see for a long time. Uh, it's just, uh, uh, if you don't want to see it, you're not gonna, you're not going to see it. So, uh, yeah, I agree. Now, in both uh, your previous book, The Vanishing Congress, as well as this one, American Materialism, you pointed to the progressive era and its changes towards the American government as yes. the source of uh, some of our problems we have today. So yes. uh, give us a bit of history. So uh, what was the progressive era and what did it bring about? Yes. Well, uh, you're, you're a very astute reader here. So, um, uh, yes. Um, I, I think in the first 150 years of our country, um, we didn't really uh, think entirely in economic terms, uh, more thought in political terms, which I think are broader, more expansive than economic terms. I think economics fits within politics. Um, politics addresses bigger questions than economics. 
And uh, when that began to change was, I think, right around the turn of the century, going into the 20th century. Um, you can see it in uh, very clearly, I, I use as an example in one of my books, the chairman of the American Economic Association, a guy named uh, uh, Edwin Seligman. And uh, he wrote a book about all this, and he kind of heralded the changing um, worldview. And he said, look, um, uh, we in America aren't and probably never will be Marxists in the sense that we think the proletariat is going to rise up and, and take over or that uh, we support the violence of the dictators of the proletariat or anything like that. He said that part of Marxism is not likely ever to happen and, and, and not certainly here. But the one thing that was very, very good about Marx, he said, was their economic interpretation of history. And that is to say, again, uh, that what moves history uh, fundamentally, not, not in every particular, fundamentally is, is economics. And uh, I, I think you see that um, in, the, uh, in, in, in progressive thinking and in, 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 in the development of economics as, a, as an important field of study itself. Economics didn't exist. There were no economics departments in 1900 or 19, you know, they really began to form in 1910, 1920, and become not only a, an independent social science, but the most important independent social science. And, uh, and um, you, you, you see that gradually uh, taking over the thought world, the intellectual world, the university world. And then you see it all kind of coming to fruition with uh, Franklin Roosevelt, with uh, his economic policies. And, and so I, I think that uh, very much has changed um, um, 80 or 100 years ago in terms of how we look at things. I also think that the progressive view is not just one of many views in the country at this point. I think fundamentally, the notions of progressivism dominate uh, American thinking now. Uh, they dominate certainly the Democratic Party. They dominate the media. They dominate the universities. They dominate the K through 12. They, they dominate the entertainment industry and increasingly seem to be dominating the, the Republican Party. And so I, I think the, 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 the broadest and deepest philosophical orientation of our country now is progressive. Uh, progressives might not want to believe that because they don't think they're that powerful and conservatives don't want to believe that because they, they hope they're not that powerful. But um, there is a, uh, I, I think, a kind of an underlying reality of progressivism to all of our thinking now. Um, and uh, only recently have we, gone, have we begun to see some signs that this might change. So. Uh -huh. Now, one of the most significant works uh, produced during the Progressive Era is um, an economic interpretation of the Constitution by Charles Beard. Um, I, I I certainly believe that today constitutional studies uh, they they seem to largely ignore Beard's entire thesis. But uh, it seems from what you, uh, from your standpoint, um, the general idea that animates Beard's work still uh, is still. Yeah. Well, I, I mentioned him in particular. There are a number of people like Beard who were part of that original progressive movement um, and, and uh, very, very close to Teddy Roosevelt and um, also then Theodore uh, Franklin Roosevelt. And so um, you, what, what we've seen in, in recent years is the development, I think, of some signs on both sides of the political aisle that maybe there's some understanding that economics is not the beginning and end of all wisdom. Um, on the conservative side, we see a uh, kind of a more of a return to the natural rights tradition. Uh, this is not a majority viewpoint at all, but uh, um, when you look at Barry Goldwater in 1964, he was like that, but he was, he was like all by himself. And now the, this, this kind of conservative natural rights tradition with originalism and, and so forth and constitutional thought um, is, is, has a much deeper base. It's beginning to 
to form a little bit more widely um, because there's media that support it, there's academic institutions that support it and so forth. It has a little broader base. And so I think that's a sign that uh, maybe some people have on the right have come to the conclusion that, well, economics isn't everything and we might do better to uh, look at things in a broader, more, more political way. I think, and here I, I may be a, a little bit harder to believe, but I think I see some signs of this on the left too. Um, the whole phenomenon about global warming um, seems to me to be not an economic issue at all. I, I mean, it requires money, as Kerry said, money, 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 money. But it's not about economics, about making people better off economically uh, the way in which uh, progressivism is. Progressivism is all about making people better off money-wise. Um, and uh, this is a different idea altogether. It's about the relationship of human beings to the planet. And this, <laughs> this could occur uh, at, at a level of good economic development or, or poor economic development. But, uh, and, and so I think this, this is a really a kind of a non-economic issue that's bubbled up on the political left that testifies to the fact that maybe it's not all about economics. I think too, and here I, I, I advanced this very <laughs> cautiously, this thought, I think the same thing is true about this idea of equity. Um, it, it seems on the surface to be all about economics, but I think underneath it, it's not really. It's all about justice. It's all about uh, e uh, equal shares. Uh, and um, that's not an economic idea. That's not part of the original economic material view um, that uh, say Marx had or that American progressive had that, you know, we're now producing enough, we can produce enough so that everybody can have enough. And uh, that's not really what equity is about is, is producing more and, and having more for everybody, but it's about evenness, sameness, uh, which is an idea of justice. And you could be even or the same, again, uh, at a rather high level of economic development or at a rather low level. Um, and uh, the chances are, I think it would be at a lower level. But, uh, you know, if you can look at Venezuela, I mean, all the talk there is about uh, the people and about uh, equity and about, uh, uh, about uh, all of that. But what's the reality? Well, it's not that anybody except a very small handful of rulers is better off than they used to be. Nobody is. People are poor generally. Uh, and so it's one thing to be equal at a decent level and it's one thing to be equal at a at, a, at an impoverished level and I think I think in equity and this thinking about equity is a bit of a departure from the progressive idea of uh, economic enrichment that, that came with progressivism yes so can we still hold out hope that uh, with our action certain countries like Iran and Venezuela can become better off either politically and or economically? Sure, I think so. I, I mean, uh, people after all are, are agents. Uh, we have agency. Uh, we're not free to do whatever we please, whenever we please, of course, but uh, we do have the ability to shape things still. And, um, you know, it, it seems to me um, it wouldn't take much of a change in either one of those countries to be able to unleash some brand new forces that make them uh, far more successful and also far more friendly to the United States. Um, not so long as the current governments remain in power, though, uh, that uh, there's no chance of um, making Iran or Venezuela more friendly to the United States uh, by negotiating with them or giving them things. Uh, the billions of dollars that this administration gave to Iran it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, the uh, uh, notion that if we uh, 
are a little nicer to Iran and let Chevron drill some oil or uh, Venezuela let Chevron drill some oil down there and uh, so forth. That therefore the government will become more friendly to us. Equally, absolutely ridiculous. And, but it seems to me that uh, there is a kind of a desire in many people to be free of having their lives run every day by people who are really uh, not acting in their best interest. Uh, acting in their own interest, uh, acting on the basis of some uh, thought that's very strange when you really stop and think about it. Yes. So yes, I think that's possible. Is, is it easy? No. Um, but again, I, I, I think the easy ways of trying to change those countries are not bound to be very successful. And the uh, change will only come if there is some uh, cataclysmic rearrangement of things somehow. I suppose uh, to play devil's advocate, um, and I'm sure this argument has been levied by um, certain groups that advocate for a, a more a closer relationship between the United States and Iran at the moment. Um, they would say that in the 1970s, even though the Soviet Union was uh, America's uh, number one ideological rival, um, yes. there were still... Um, there were still negotiations and cooperations being uh, fostered between the two um, blocks. Um, so the yes. sort treaties, for example, and I suppose the general framework of detente. Um, yes. So uh, why could we not do the same with uh, the Iranian nation at this point? Yes, well, I, I'm not saying that nothing is possible. I just don't think you're going to see any fundamental changes at all. Um, and indeed, if you look at the Soviet Union as a good example of that, um, they continued on uh, and until they uh, really became so bankrupt that, uh, that, that the whole regime fell apart. And only then did you begin to see for at least some years fundamental changes in, in, in Russia um, that um, began to reshape things. And um, unfortunately, that didn't last so very long before Putin consolidated himself. But I'm not saying that nothing could be done, but um, uh, if you just look at the, um, uh, let's let's take the Iranian nuclear program. We're trying to talk them out of that. I, I don't think it's likely to talk them out of it or negotiate them out of it at all. Uh, why would they do that? Um, I wouldn't if I were in their position. And, and, and so, um, you know, we're not, we, we, we may get some deal of some kind of, you know, grain sales or this or that or something, but things that fundamentally transform the regime and what their goals and what their aims are, I don't think are going to happen uh, by negotiation any more than it did in the case of the uh, Soviet Union. Um, there, it was particularly important, at least with regard to the nuclear programs, that uh, we find some way of... Uh, of existing and talking to each other and giving each other some forewarning about what we're doing with military exercises and the hotline and all of that. But I, I think there too, the idea that you could have ever changed the Soviet Union uh, by pointing out to them um, how wealthy the United States is and look, you could be like that too. Uh, Trump <laughs> tried out a version of that, I think with Kim. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure Kim was very impressed by uh, seeing all the wealth and so forth. But is it going to change his nuclear program? No, not one bit. Uh, you're not going to buy him out of it in any way. You're not going to negotiate him out of it. Uh, the only thing that's likely to change it is, is to um, see some internal convulsion in North Korea or some uh, conflagration, uh, some, some transformative change, not... Negotiations. So I think negotiations are okay. They're 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 good to kind of keep them um, talking and so forth. But to expect much from them is probably a mistake. I hate to sound so cynical, but uh, uh, it seems to me that's what the record shows. Now um, another uh, foreign conflict that's ongoing right now is the one between um, Israel and um, the various terrorist groups that are attacking it. Um, so in some two weeks time, we'll reach the one year anniversary of October the 7th. Yeah. So um, 
in what ways uh, can the U.S.-Israel relationship be improved at this point in time? Well, um, I, I, I don't think it's going to improve uh, with the current leadership we have either in the United States or, or in Israel. I think uh, uh, Bibi is determined to try to defeat Hamas and prevent this from ever occurring again by, in effect, destroying Hamas's military arm more or less entirely. Maybe not ever fully, but more or less entirely. And uh, the Biden administration seems uh, rather more concerned that uh, this is uh, having too many uh, collateral casualties and uh, they want him to uh, adopt some kind of peace, uh, uh, ceasefire of some kind. And, and so I, I think that that's not likely to, to be different. It's not likely to be different at all. Maybe worse even if Harris is elected. I think she probably feels a little more strongly about this than Biden did. Um, uh, it would change, I think, if Trump were elected. I think that uh, Trump uh, would uh, let BB do whatever he wanted and, and uh, wouldn't be very critical. I, I, I think, though, to a certain extent, um, the U.S.-Israel relationship, uh, who acts with Israel's interests in, in, in mind, the, the real question is not exactly what you think about Hamas or what you think of Hezbollah or anything, but again, Ir Iran. Ir Iran is funding and supporting and supplying all of these groups. And if it weren't, uh, it would look a lot different. Um, and uh, so again, um, the, the U.S.-Israel policy doesn't take place in a vacuum, but it uh, exists in a broader context in which Iran is the principal um, actor, I think, on the other side. And, and uh, until that uh, relationship is somehow changed and Iran is no longer supporting forces in Syria, forces in Hezbollah, forces in Hamas, forces in the West Bank, I, I, I think uh, I, I think Israel is going to continue to confront serious ongoing problems. Um, I, I personally have a lot of sympathy for Israel. I uh, I've always been a supporter of Israel. I, I think that uh, um, there is not that Bibi wants to do all these things. He just feels like he has to because we've tried out other things like giving uh, control of uh, uh, Gaza to uh, Palestinians and uh, they proceeded to elect Hamas. And so uh, I, I think that uh, uh, there probably won't be any changes in the short term, meaning four, five months. But depending on the election, maybe there will. And of course, here's the $64 million question. Um, should we still hold out hope for peace between Israel and the Palestinians? Uh, sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> why not? But is, is, is it likely? Um no, no. I, I had a friend uh, who was very cynical once said, uh, the only way you're going to resolve this issue is either to kill every Palestinian or move Israel to Iowa. And, uh, you know, that may be a bit much, but, uh, I, 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 you know, I think the prospects are, are not so good, especially now in the course of this invasion of Gaza, Israel's killed a lot of people. Not, not as many maybe as, uh, as Hamas has said, but a lot of people. And if you're a family member of someone who's been killed, who wasn't even a combatant and so forth, this is you take very, uh, very deeply. And uh, so I, I don't see this getting better uh, in, in the short term. Um, and uh, no one has been smart enough to think up an arrangement that uh, sufficiently would satisfy uh, the Palestinians and Israel to, uh, to uh, find a way forward uh, in which... Uh, Maybe people don't love each other immediately, but they at least uh, will live with each other and uh, maybe begin over time to cooperate. But I think it's a, a very, very high bar. <laughs> yes. So you mentioned um, education policies. Um, yeah. So what are some ways in which, um, well, I, I think there are two areas uh, that we can focus on. One is uh, grade school, so K-12, and the other is higher education. Um, yeah. So um, what are some of the ways in which uh, 
uh, the U.S. can better educate its uh, great school students? First? Yeah. Well, uh, again, I describe in my book, if you sit on any debate about education policy in the executive branch or in the Congress, what's it all about? Well, what's it all about is, are we giving more money to um, education or less? Uh, that's the question. Um, and it, it turns out that the amount of money that uh, uh, the federal government provides, which which is a minority, by the way, the states and localities provide much more, um, doesn't really have that big of an impact. And if you look at the statistics, they're astonishing. There's no correlation between spending more money on education and students being better educated. There's just not. Um, and uh, I think we need to do things not money dependent. Part of the problem is uh, American families. Uh, there are a lot of families in America who don't pay any attention to their children. They don't take much care of them. They don't encourage education. And so the kids show up in the kindergarten or first grade and they not only don't know anything, they don't have basic knowledge about numbers or letters or anything, but they also don't uh, even know why they should, why it's important. Um, and, and so I, I think um, ultimately some kinds of uh, changes in the family values and structure will be important. I think too, though, that uh, there are other things that could be done. And um, I'm a very big believer in school choice that that seems to uh, succeed wherever it's tried. Um, you can for less money, um, but with some uh, intellectual thinking, uh, create schools that uh, are better educating their students. And uh, so I, I, I don't know that if we go on basically just saying, uh, well, uh, last year, the education department budget was so many billion, and this year we're increasing it by five billion. Uh, that, that seems to me more or less <laughs> irrelevant. Um, there's no connection across time or across space between states that spending more money produces better outcomes. And I think there's no doubt that uh, this generation of young people uh, is every bit as smart as previous generations, they're, they're native intelligent, but, but they, they, they really are far more poorly educated that we knew a lot more about a lot of things than people today do. And so I, I, um, I, I think there need to be some rather fundamental changes in outlook in terms of competition, which is always, always successful wherever it's employed in whatever field. And um, even in terms of thinking, try to rethink um, how we uh, how we uh, help families to become more uh, oriented toward the success of their children, um, rather than simply uh, giving more money to uh, school teachers. Um, they need to be paid, and they should be paid well. They have a hard job. In fact, it puts too much pressure on them. I think uh, to expect them to begin educating people who come into their school with no knowledge and, and with no, in, no interest in having any, uh, but who just uh, are going to fill up the space. So um, I, th I think, again, we need to get out of the material framework and uh, adopt some broader, more transformative changes. Yes. So in terms of uh, higher ed, um, I believe this year is the first year of uh, the first class of uh, the University of Austin in Texas. Yeah, I wonder um, how much stock do you put in that project? Well, I think you've seen that. You've seen a special program at North Carolina. You've seen a couple of other ones or Colorado has a, not a whole program, but at least a professor, I think, to bring some political diversity to their uh, school. Uh, and uh, I think it's all to the good. Um, I, I, I think uh, diversity is fine. Um, but if you only make it about what people's skin color is, which is all that we seem to be talking about today, uh, you're really looking at the wrong kind of diversity. Uh, there needs to be a diversity of, of ideas and of thinking and of uh, exchange. Um, and so 
I, I think those programs are good. Whether they develop enough of a critical mass to uh, to succeed um, broadly, I, I I don't know. I, I can't predict, but I think they uh, they certainly have their uh, uh, their advantages, and and I, I'm all for them. Okay. So finally, um, who is um, an American foreign policy mind from the past that uh, present American foreign policy leaders should learn from? So other than yourself, of course. I, I, I exclude myself entirely. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a very it's a very good question. Uh, and I'd have to think about it a little bit to give you a really good answer. Um, I, I've been very impressed by the people that uh, uh, ran American foreign policy uh, after World War II um, and created the entire uh, uh, post-World War II world and the institutions that they did. Uh, and so I would look to them. Uh, I'm also very impressed by uh, uh, the American foreign policy at the end of the Soviet Union uh, with Secretary Jim Baker and some others, uh, Bob Zellick, um, and working under George George H. W. Bush, um, who really navigated a very complicated situation, which was the decline and the disappearance of the Soviet Union, and rolling Germany all into NATO, and uh, doing it without being threatening to Russia and bringing France and England along who are no particular fans of a united Germany either. Um, that, that, that is a very thoughtful group. And so um, I guess I'd look back to people who actually accomplished things. Uh, and that would include people at the, at the uh, end of World War II and, and also again in the, the late 1980s and early 1990s. Uh, uh, where they uh, brought about some very positive results, I think, uh, because they were thoughtful, they weren't rash, they uh, understood all the forces, they knew um, how to relate to Helmut Kohl in the late 1980s, they, they knew that Margaret Thatcher or the Brits or the, the French were not going to be enthusiastic about German unification, they, they knew what the Russians feared and the they tried to make agreements that uh, we wouldn't push the military edge of NATO right up to the end of East Germany right away and, and so forth. And they, they um, kind of thought through the whole thing in a careful way. Um, I, I guess I, I point to those two groups of people as uh, people that are worth reading about, thinking about, looking at, and seeing how they did what they did. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah, I was thinking of Dean Atchison too, as you were answering that. Yeah, yeah. Well, Marshall and Atchison, all those folks, I mean, a very, very uh, unusually good group. I mean, we've had the good fortune in this country to have uh, really excellent people at important times. Um, we did in the beginning, uh, where you could find a group like Washington and, and uh, Hamilton and, and Jefferson and Madison. I mean, we're, this, this is a group that doesn't just grow on a tree. I mean, it, uh, it's a very rare thing. And, and uh, I think the same thing was true about the post-World War II group. And uh, also a little bit about the uh, late 1980s, early 1990s group. So. I think that's a wonderful note to end on. Thank you very much, Jeff Berkner, for joining the show. Well, you're very kind. Thank you. I wish you well on your podcast.